Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Welcome to Syosset Library's Turn the Page podcast. I am your host, Jessica, and I am here with the author of The Father That She Went to Find, Carter Wilson. This was a really interesting book. It went in places I was definitely not expecting. Um, it was a road trip for the readers and the characters. Uh, welcome, and please tell us about this book and where the idea came from. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, yeah, this was uh, this is my ninth book, but it was um, this was my pandemic book. I don't know if you get a lot of guests talking about their pandemic books, but I think the people that I've talked to. Uh, their pandemic books tend to be a little bit different than what they they write, and uh, I couldn't I couldn't get this woman out of my head. I kept thinking about this twenty uh, one year old woman who um, was a savant, and that's all I knew about this book. And it ended up, like you said, being very much of a kind of a coming of age, kind of a road trip, but it's still a thriller. But it was it was I will say it's different. Uh, than than most of uh, of my other books in terms of um, kind of how I presented, I guess, the action. So interesting that you say that this is your uh, pandemic book. Wow. You know, it's so funny because we do get authors talking about their pandemic book. Um, but I think like, yeah, this that's really interesting that this was your pandemic book, considering um, that it's not like claustrophobic or anything like that. It's really, you know, like I mentioned, like it's a road trip book and it gets you out, which I guess is kind of what people wanted during the pandemic. Uh, like how early in the pandemic did you start writing this? Like when did Penny come onto <laughs> the stage and tell you you needed to write her story? Yeah, I think... I think in the early days and, and and one thing that I've kind of noticed and and in talking to other authors in their pandemic books, there was, a, you know, there's kind of collective yearning to write about maybe what anyone would consider to be the good old days. So some kind of yearning of nostalgia. And so I placed the book in 1987 and that's, and I just, again, you know, I started thinking about this woman, uh, but that the funny thing about when you start, you know, nostalgia is such a fleeting, uh, intangible thing. And then when you actually start writing about that time period, you realize like, oh, those were pretty messed up times too. <laughs> there, there were no, there's really no good old days. Um, but, you know, 1987, I was a 17 year old in Los Angeles and, you know, I wanted to write a scene with an arcade and a shopping mall. And, you know, there was something safe for me to be able to write that. Um, and then again, also the road trip aspect, just getting out, being free and not having kind of all the weight of the world. Um, but yet bad things still do happen. <laughs> yeah, I definitely see that. And I like that you mentioned that there really were no good old days. I think that it is very easy not that Penny had any good old days because right. <laughs> her days were pretty crazy, um, yeah. as you'll find when you read the book. But, um, you know, yeah, I think that that's kind of an important thing to note, you know, like when you talk about nostalgia glasses or nostalgia goggles that you look back on something, you know, there's always for, for a lot of people, I think there's um, this like there's a period in time where you're just like, ah, oh, if only things were as simple as they were then. And there are things that certainly were simpler back then, which I'll get to, um, which would have changed the book drastically had the book been written during this time period. But uh, yeah, but, um, you know, I think like there is, there, there's definitely a market for books that are written in the 80s and the 90s, especially like if, you know, um, the public's obsession with Stranger Things has told us anything. Everybody wants to believe that the 80s was like this magical time <laughs> where like in general, everything was covered in cigarette smoke and kind of like this really weird color of brown, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I there was do. a lot of things, messed yeah. up things going on in the 80s. It was a time of greed. It, you know, yeah. it was a time of you know, profound ignorance in many ways. Um, yep. 
yeah and materialism but yep. again you know when you're 17 years old that's what you hearken back to um but i think the beauty of it too is like you start getting into it and as a thriller writer you realize like you know there's no lifeline um there's no smartphones and that's yep. that's profoundly fun to write from that perspective of not only having the knowledge of what it was like but realizing like when you're out on your own you are out on your own and um you know all, all the smarts in the world might not not be enough to save you oh totally and i was going to say you know i've been talking to some authors lately and they talk about this as like the cell phone dilemma you know where like your story as i mentioned it would be drastically different if penny could have just googled things <laughs> you right. know like right. they're really it really would have changed completely and you know one thing that i love about the book is like the father that the father she went to find is like almost like the catalyst for certain things that happen but it's really a found family book too it's you know yeah. about the family that she found along the way and also some really crazy things that um that happened which again would have changed drastically had there been a lifeline had she been able to you know, call someone or look something up. Um, so, right. you know, there's some other things that she, so there's some things that happened in this book. So Penny, um, you know, she, when she's, I believe was it when she was seven, she fell down this, she fell down the stairs. And after that she was considered um, a savant and she sees um, numbers as colors, which I always have trouble pronouncing this. Is it synesthesia? Mm -hmm. um yep. when you yeah when your senses are sort of um uh connected like that right. uh and she has this really interesting relationship with her absentee father where he sends her a birthday card every year and she sort of has like this internal dialogue with him that you're kind of wondering like is this real or is this mm -hmm. you know in her mind um and it really just kind of sets her up to be a really interesting character but uh you know, she's very sheltered, but she's also very smart. Did you do a lot of research into people who sort of, um, you know, experience these phenomena and sort of, especially like how they might have been, um, how they might have been regarded during that time period in the 80s? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, I knew, and again, you know, I, I, nothing is ever intentional. I just, I write what I feel. And then when I go back and I edit, then I start to, kind of think about the structure and the plot a little bit more. Um, so I just, I, you know, I didn't necessarily want her to be a savant. It's just, this is the person who came to me. Um, but I did decide very, uh, very actively that, that I didn't want her to be born having been born with savantism. So Penny has what's called acquired savant syndrome, um, which is exceptionally rare, um, which is, you know, something physically happens to you. And it, you know, for lack of a better term, it jolts your brain in, in, in a way that you start to, um, demonstrate savant like abilities um so yes I, I i did as much research as there was research to be found um there are truly you know perhaps 75 people in the world with this so you know when we talk about exceptionally rare it's about as rare as it gets um but I, I you know i i think it was important to the story that this trauma caused to her when she was um a young girl you know kind of opened her yeah, opened her world and shut it down at the same time. Um, so I was really intrigued with that duality of it all. So about some of the people she meets along the way, you know, um, and it's interesting because I do, I do know of people who have like photographic memories and, mm -hmm. you know, have like just sort of what what some people might consider gifts and what other people might consider something else, you know. Um, but uh, she meets a lot of people along the way. Um, and some of them look at her as a something sort of like a possession almost or something, you know, to, you know, to be used. And some of them connect with her, um, like, um, uh, Travis is it yeah. um you know connects with her in this really interesting way um and 
the two of them go through it together while she's looking for her dad. And then um, she meets somebody else um, named Fia who's connected in a different way, which I don't want to talk about. But um, so everything started with Penny. How did she meet these other people? How did she like, did you just sort of, do you sort of just like stumble into these situations with her? Yeah, I think stumbling is probably uh, the, the the perfect word to describe it because I don't know. I just, I just pictured her leaving her house and I'm like literally where are you going to go you don't know how to drive you're going to walk you know and so I realized like she goes to the mall because she's been to the mall before and and then you start thinking like well you're going to meet somebody and it's not necessarily purposeful but I just picture like her like how are you going to interact with other people when you really don't have much social skills at all um and then I just, you know, it, but when I write, it's very cinematic to me, at least I see the scene and then I just see somebody approaching her. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Who's this person? And that might not be anybody. And it might be somebody I write and then I get rid of. And if that person starts to become more and more intriguing, I'm like, oh, you have a person in your life now. What are you going to do about that? Um, and so you keep getting these questions as a writer. What if this? What if that? Um, and you just kind of keep following these paths and and see where it takes you. And sometimes they lead to dead ends. Sometimes they open up things you had never even conceptualized. And and that's the that's really to me the joy of writing is every day sitting down I'm like what happens now? I don't know. Let's find out. That's that's exciting to me. I love it. Um, and that's a, that does sound really exciting and a lot of fun. Um, did you know the end point? Like, did you know what the end of the journey was going to be? Or did you just sort of stumble onto it just the way that Penny did? Yeah, I, I you know, I after all these books, I realized without outlining any of them about 60, 70% of the way in is when I kind of realized maybe what the book's about. Um, and then about 80% in, I start having thoughts about how it might end. Um, but I never know at the beginning. And I'm always, you know, I it could take one page of writing to put me in an entirely new direction because I'll, something will just occur to me or something will you know, unfold in front of me that I, I have such a, I have such respect for people who are hardcore outliners. Cause I, I don't know how your brain works to do that. Um, and they would say the same about Panzers. Um, but to me, the joy is not knowing. And, and if I surprise myself, then hopefully um, the reader is going to be surprised, but I will say this, this particular novel was an exceptional challenge in the sense that when I first, I almost write everything from first person, present tense, and I started thinking about this woman, Penny. I'm like, I don't, I don't know if I can be close enough to this person to write that. And so I wrote the entire book, third person past tense, and it just was not working. And it was not working with my agent, with my editor. And so I rewrote the entire book, first person present. And then Penny kind of <laughs> revealed herself through that process. But that was, that was a real challenge. I thought that it worked really well. Now I'm trying to imagine what it would have been like. Huh. You lose a lot of the voice. It's it's a lot. And, and the problem is not necessarily a problem, but Penny is kind of an ex, in, an inaccessible person. Um, so she doesn't have this crazy strong personality. And so when you write a third person past, you, you lose what there is of it. Um, so she becomes... I mean, as hard as she is to relate to anyway, it's even more difficult when you you take that distance between you and her. Um, so I realized that the voice comes alive when you get into that first person present, or at least for me, it does. So this was your pandemic book that you wrote. I have to ask because I know um, I was a furious reader during the pandemic. Did you read a lot during the pandemic? And what were your pandemic reads? You know, I I tend to, and it depends on what I'm writing at the time and what stage I'm at. Um, I don't read much in terms of what I write, um, unless 
I'm blurbing or, you know, sometimes I do, I read mostly nonfiction um, or, or, you know, I love uh, memoirs, biographies, uh, corporate uh, malfeasance uh, <laughs> scandals and things like that. Um, so I was probably reading the same amount that I usually do, but, um, but I'll also, you know, consume a lot through like Netflix and prime and stuff, because I, you know, I just love a good story, however it's told. And, and, I think during the pandemic, you were again leaning towards movies set in earlier times because it just felt like a relief in a way. So now I have to ask what your pandemic watches were because that was a time. There were some really, uh, uh, you know, there were some really interesting things that people consumed back then. Yeah, I had I wanted nothing to do with anything about the pandemic. Like, and, you know, this was a time when my kids were in their mid to late teens and everybody was at home. Um, so I was watching with them, I think a lot of garbage, um, just because it was like, you know, popcorn watches and it was something that we could all watch and it was easy and it was light. Um, so I, I remember not watching a lot of real serious stuff because you just had to kind of adjust your brain for a little while. Yeah, there there was sort of like a, a camp of people who would watch things that were really serious. And then, I don't know, there there was like, there was the Tiger King crowd, which was <laughs> depressing in a weird way. Right. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, it, it was it was definitely a very interesting time for consumption of all kinds of media. I mean, I know that I found myself reading a lot more thrillers and horror back in that time period. Uh, you know, I guess, which is kind of why I was curious. Um, so uh, this book was super, super fun. I am definitely going to be recommending it to people. Um, are you, do, are you like, do you usually work on one book after another? Do you take a rest uh, between yeah, there's no real rest. I mean, maybe a, a few days or something like that. Um, but usually about halfway into a book, you know, that thing will happen where I have an idea or just a character um, and that will just, and, and they don't write anything down. And if they stay with me, then maybe that will be the next book. And I remember finishing this book and then thinking like, okay, I want to write something really scary now. I just, it was, that was my mood. I want to be like really in your face, um, you know, kind of a deep, dark thriller. And so that's, that became my next book. Uh, Tell me what you did, which comes out next January, but it's, it's a completely different story. <laughs> I will see you next January. I hope because that is <laughs> I'm, my I'm really jam. excited for that one as well. <laughs> that one's got some different elements to it that, that are some different than I've ever done before. And I think it'll, It'll be interesting to see how it's received. Awesome. Carter Wilson, thank you so much. The father uh, that she went to find is uh, going to be in bookstores and libraries when again? April 2nd. April 2nd. So uh, no Three fooling. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, it will be in the library and bookstores by the time that this airs. And it is a really fun ride. And I literally cannot wait to see what you do next because great. this one was great. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me on, Jessica. Thank you for coming. So once again, this was Jessica with Syosset Libraries Turn the Page podcast. Our guest today was Carter Wilson, and we are going to close this chapter of Turn the Page. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.